Today's episode is made possible with support from Platinum Bank. Your bank should be solving your problems, not creating them. Platinum Bank partners with Twin Cities executives to help them grow their business. Learn more online at PlatinumBankMN.com. Platinum Bank, providing a means to a dream. Whether I was, you know, treating a child, a man or a woman, the conversation, you know, the, the appointment almost always led to talking about shoes. From Twin Cities Business, this is By All Means, a show about innovation, drive, and purpose, and the leaders who make business work in Minnesota. I'm Allison Kaplan, your host and editor-in-chief of Twin Cities Business Magazine. We're coming to you from the studios of our presenting sponsor, the University of St. Thomas's Opus College of Business, serving more than 3,000 students enrolled in its undergraduate and graduate business programs. The college develops effective, principled business leaders who think globally and act ethically. And now, by all means. Manolo Blahnik, Jimmy Chu, Christian Louboutin, Marion Park. It takes a lot of guts, a big investment, and a clear vision to launch a designer shoe company with no experience in the field. But that's exactly what Marion Park has done in just a few short years. She has something those other brands don't, a medical degree. That's right, Marion Park is a foot and ankle surgeon, and it was in the early days of her podiatry practice in the Twin Cities that she realized her knowledge of the foot and biomechanics, combined with her love of fashion, made her the perfect person to create a luxury shoe brand that offers style and comfort. Anyone who's left a party barefoot because their feet were throbbing from hours in stilettos knows what a tall order that is. Bloomingdale's quickly placed an order and other high-end retailers followed. Of course, the pandemic has not been the best time to be in the designer shoe business, and Marion will talk about her pivot. But first, we go back to the roots of her inspiration growing up in Oklahoma. So it's funny because I always really admired the 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 moms and the dads who were doctors. I, I I played a lot of sports growing up, and I thought it was really really cool when a mom or a dad can run out onto the field. They, uh-huh. could, they could run out whenever someone was hurt, um, and they could sort of save the day. And, yeah, you know, you know, rush in, and um, I thought that was really cool. Yeah, and as simple as that was, I thought, okay, that's I think I, that's what I want to be. I want to go in there and save hmm. the day. Were your parents in uh, not, the healthcare no. industry? Not at all. My um, on my father's side, we come from a long line of lawyers. We actually have this really fantastic uh, photo of two men, cowboys. Uh-huh. Um, standing outside of a tent and it's right after the Oklahoma land run Mm -hmm. and it says Garrett and Garrett lawyers (laughs) on the side of the tent yeah so my dad was from a very small town his father was an attorney who became um, a judge he uh, my grandfather eventually was on the supreme court of the state of Oklahoma Mm -hmm. on the um, on the appellate branch and um, and my dad was an attorney Mm -hmm. so yeah no no um, healthcare professionals in in my family but my husband's family they um, it's actually a long line of uh, line of ophthalmologists ah Okay. So, um, so actually, his mother, who I admire, my mother-in-law, she is a pediatric neurologist. Wow. So she was another one of those moms who I looked at um, as we were growing up because we grew up together, my husband and I. Oh. And um, I thought, wow, she, you know, it's just blown away by you know the moms and, and the dads. And sure, so. and not as common then, right, to see a a, a mom who is a practicing physician and yeah. doing it all. Right. Yeah. So did you? decide right away that you wanted to go into podiatry? How did you choose feet? <laughs> <laughs> so um, actually, I, I knew I wanted to be in healthcare, and I was shadowing a lot of different you know, friends of my parents, family friends, and I, I've shadowed a, a podiatrist, and I just loved it. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw that you know podiatrists were starting to become the, the experts in the foot and ankle, and actually today, um, you know, big orthopedic groups are hiring now um, podiatrists who were trained the way I was trained, um, which is uh, surgery of the foot and ankle. Mm. Um, so I saw that that sort of transition was happening. I thought, well, that's interesting. I could be a surgeon. But then you're also doing a lot of really interesting clinical work. Um, you're working with you know, children. You're working with um, men, women, all ages. Um, you see dermatology Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, and podiatry. You see neurology. You see orthopedics. So there's a really broad range of things that you see in the foot and ankle. And um, 
so yeah, then I went to podiatry school up in Chicago, mm-hmm. um, did you know, four years of, of school, and then a three-year uh, uh, foot and ankle surgical residency. And were you wearing heels throughout your residency? <laughs> you know, it was funny. <laughs> did so you I... always look like this? Did you always look like a fashion designer? When when you're in a surgical residency, you're mostly wearing scrubs um, <laughs> and clogs during the day. But there were days where if I didn't have surgery, which was rare, I was so excited to dress up. And I, I, was, I was in residency in South Florida. And I remember one day I wore boots, these like riding boots. Uh-huh. And Everybody said something. They were like, <laughs> I couldn't walk down the hallway of the hospital without someone saying, "Nice boots." Yeah, it's like, has no one seen boots around here <laughs> in South Florida? I know, but come no, on. no Crocs for you, huh? Uh, not a Croc no, fan. No. Um, <laughs> personally, um, I've seen some of their collaborations, and I think they've, yeah, mm-hmm. they've done a lot of cool things, but not for me. So, was personally. it a job that led you to Minneapolis? How did you end up here? It, it was my husband's job Okay, that led us here. But funny enough, Allie, I used to um, spend my summers here. I used to come to summer camp. Oh. Um, and I'd go to a camp up in uh, near Brainerd. Which camp? Camp Lake Hubert. Oh, sure. A lot of Minnesotans know <laughs> Camp Lake Hubert. That's amazing. And from Oklahoma to Camp Lake Hubert. Yeah, you know, I mean, shout out to Camp Lake Hubert, I guess. So. <laughs> <laughs> a, little, a little plug for Camp Lake Hubert. They do a really good job of trying to get a, um, a more eclectic, um, you know, camper mm-hmm. uh, population, if that's the right word. Interesting. Um, and so, yeah, they, they would come and kind of recruit, uh, if you will, from, you know, Oklahoma and Texas. And uh-huh. So there was a sort of little group of us from Oklahoma City who would come up to Minnesota in the summers. That was, I mean, coming from Oklahoma, there was not a direct flight. We'd have to fly down to Dallas <laughs> and then fly up to Minneapolis and then take the the bus ride up to Brainerd. But so when my husband got the job offer here, was considering it, I had never experienced a Minnesota winter. (laughs) (laughs) But you knew the summers were really nice. I knew the summers were (laughs) lovely. So I said, I loved summer camp. So sure, why not? So you joined a practice here in the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. So moved here um, right a month after our first baby was born. Yeah. And um and during that time I actually um I started the company. I registered for the um the LLC. During that year when I was practicing in San Francisco, um whether I was, you know, s- s- treating a child, a, a a man or a woman, the the conversation, the the you know, the the appointment almost always led to talking about shoes. Hmm. Because everyone is there for a foot problem. Right. Right. And so we're talking about, you know, how you got there or what your foot type is and, you know, what to avoid, what to look for when shopping for shoes. Uh-huh. And and I love that. I still I still love that. Uh-huh. Uh, so your love of shoes really came even before your love of medicine. Is that fair to say? <laughs> well, I mean, because I'm, you know, I wore shoes. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you liked you. You always appreciated fashion. Oh, yeah. No, always, always loved fashion. Always really, you know, again, sort of admired like the older siblings of my, you know, friends. And, yeah. You know, the super fashionable moms and, and that sort of thing. And mm-hmm. um, my mother, uh, excuse me, my grandmother, uh, she actually would sew clothes for my sister and I. She used to make us, you know, matching, uh, you know, holiday dresses and that kind of thing. So, you know, there was always sort of an excitement around getting sure. dressed up and yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, but I, I mean, I had my fair... Like all women have had my fair share of uncomfortable shoes and just scratching your head saying, why can't these be made differently? Mm -hmm. Uh, Or also there's like, you know, why did I put these shoes on? Right. Oh, my gosh. Why did I wear these shoes? Of course. Um, And and we just sort of accept that our feet are going to hurt. And why should it be that way? Yeah. And it's and that's evolved in a lot of ways, obviously, um, you know, pre pre COVID and now post COVID, too. But I mean, the, the whole idea behind starting the business was that, you know, historically a, a beautiful shoe, an Italian made designer shoe was painful mm-hmm. and they're, they're, they they were uncomfortable. But if you wanted a beautiful shoe, that's what you had to right. accept. Price right? you pay. Yeah. So, and then if you wanted a quote unquote sensible shoe, uh-huh. it was going to look that way, right? Just that word. Right. Yeah. It wasn't going to come from a brand that had much I don't know, that you'd really admired or yeah. thought was cool. And you wouldn't look down while you're at the event and be really excited about your shoes. And I thought, well, you know, my mother my mother was an artist. Um, so I'd grown up in art classes and just always had that sort of created, creative part of my life. And I thought, you know, I might have 
this unique skill set to bring, you know, what I know about anatomy and biomechanics in in an artful way, deliver that in a tasteful and artful way, um, and then create a brand that women like and want to talk about, you know, um, because I think in the past, the brands big and small who've tried to bring these two worlds together, um, and even now, um, they're not the, not my particular taste. Um, the the quality level isn't where where we are, mm -hmm. um, and um, I think they fall short on the fashion yeah side of things. It's kind of amazing when you think about it that other shoe brands haven't thought. Let's bring on a medical expert. Let's well, talk to a podiatrist. Some of them have, Allie, but I think that maybe they they're things got watered down, mm -hmm. and that's something I always worry about too. I'm like, we don't you know want to water down you know, what the real mission and point of the, the company is. And it, it's easy to lose your way, right? Because you get excited about, you hear about what this new trend is, right? Sure. There are all these trend um, companies that come forward every season. So you're like, okay, I, how do we interpret, what's the what's the Marion Park interpretation of that trend? Right, right. And you can get really excited and you can get off course. Yeah. And then, you know, you look at the shoe and you're like, gosh, well, the arch doesn't really look like it's as contoured as it should be. Or gosh, that's really hard to put on yeah. or, you know, things like that, because we really, we pride ourselves in, you know, again, being that, you know, um, lovely and uh, beautiful shoe, but also ha that has that smart design to it, right. that thoughtfulness. Right. So there you are pretty early in your medical career, you're practicing, you do surgery, you see patients, everyone's asking you what shoes to wear. You don't have any great, lovely brands to recommend. You start thinking, maybe I should start a shoe company. What were the first things you did? You know, again, I started thinking like, you know, I do have this unique skill set of, um, you know, I, I loving fashion, growing up in an artistic household and environment, um, and then having the the anatomy and, and the biomechanics perspective. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, maybe I should. And yeah. so I said to my husband, I have this incredibly supportive husband. And he's went, a doctor as well. He is. Right? Yep. Okay. He's um, he's a retina surgeon. OK. And um, I came to him and I said, I have this idea and I just I can't stop thinking about it. And of course, the first thing he said to me, which I think it's I think it was good. It sounds harsh. Yeah. <laughs> he's not a harsh guy. But he said, well, if it's such a great idea, how come nobody's done it before? Mm. And I said, well, people have there have been brands who've tried it before. There have been large brands. There have been small brands and still even today. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't think any of them are have done it or are doing it on this quality level. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we we produce in Italy. We're in the same factories that produce for every inter internationally recognized brand you can think of. Mm -hmm. um, we source from all the same tanneries. So the, the materials we use, the craftsmen who are making my shoes, I mean, it's second to none. They're best in the world. No one's ever really brought that level of craftsmanship and quality yeah. to this concept. Did you convince him? Was this your answer at the time? Well, I did a, a lot of reading. Yeah. <laughs> that was, yes, it, the, yes, that was my answer at the time. And I did a ton of reading. Um, I ended up reaching out to the Italian Trade Commission in New York, uh -huh. who, if you're not familiar with them, basically um, anybody who wants to do some kind of business in Italy, whether you want to import um, ceramics mm -hmm. or pasta, let's say, they will connect you with a supplier or a factory. So hmm. you, you know, contact them. I contacted them and I said, I uh, want to start a shoe brand. This was actually your first move. Before you sat down and started designing or prototyping, you were, you knew you had to go to Italy. Well, I, I knew that the brands that I admired most produced out of Italy. Now, there are some really great brands too that are producing in Brazil and Spain. But I, you know, I said, you know, I really want to set us apart. This is what's going to be our, you know, differentiator in addition, obviously, yeah. to, you know, bringing the two together, which that wasn't the novel concept. The novel concept was to do it in a really elevated and tasteful way, right? right. In a way that didn't scream that you're wearing a shoe that's designed by a doctor. <laughs> but were you, right. And were you at all worried as you were starting to piece this together that you could actually make a comfortable, oh, oh, yeah. fancy Heel. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. So I went and I bought a really inexpensive pair of stilettos. Uh -huh. Like I went, I think I went to like DSW uh -huh. and I bought just like a $30 pair of shoes. Right. And I literally took scissors to it and I cut it open and um, I went to um, 
the orthotist, so the, the gentleman who was making all the orthotics mm. in, in my office at the time. Mm -hmm. So I was practicing um, part-time in um, Edina and Shanhassen, part-time in Woodbury. Mm -hmm. But all these part-time job, <laughs> jobs were <laughs> like, like a lot of jobs. patched together yeah. <laughs> as into a, a full-time job um, when, I, when I started um, operating and seeing patients in the Twin Cities. Um, so I went to um, Dave, is his name, and I went to him and I said, Look, I'm thinking about starting this shoe brand, and I mean, I gave him the gist of what the concept would be, and I said I need to make a like, yeah, a prototype to take over to Italy to explain to them how I want the insole of the shoe to be different. So I took this, you know, like dismembered shoe that I bought at DSW, and we'd ripped out the insole, and um, and I talked him through what the principles of the insole would be and he and his team helped me to make the first iteration mm -hmm. first prototype to take over to italy and explain what i wanted to do um and i'm excited actually ali um we found out just what's today wednesday right tuesday Is we're right? only on tuesday today's only yeah. tuesday mm -hmm. oh god <laughs> <laughs> okay well we found out this week uh -huh. um we're getting our second patent Congratulations. Thank you. It's really wow. exciting. Yeah. Um, is that about design? Is that It's for the insole okay. of my shoe. So we already had um uh, our first patent which was um a more specific it was in the way patents work. Don't I mm -hmm. I'm probably one of the worst people to ask, but um it's not a design patent. It's a utility patent which is a lot more difficult to get. Okay. So um the first it's easier to get a more specific patent mm -hmm. uh, but now we are getting a second one that's more general and broad wow so super how exciting long, how long did you spend figuring out that that prototype figuring out the construction of what a marion park shoe would be like and i would imagine that it's a lot harder to build in comfort when you're doing pretty delicate heels and sandals like you do well and that that was part of the problem that is that's Part of the problem that we're trying to solve is that women's shoes, especially sandals, mm -hmm. um, and even dress shoes like you're wearing today, mm -hmm. there is a fixed volume in that shoe. So if you want to add a pad or something um, inside of the shoe, the shoe gets really tight yeah. and really uncomfortable. So the idea always was to make the modifications a permanent change to the shoe. It wasn't removable. It wasn't going to shift around. It wasn't going to poke out the side. Mm -hmm. Not going to be neon orange not going to be brown with perforated holes you know it's gonna be very tastefully and discreetly incorporated into every design in the shoe but um but how we did it i mean ultimately was taking that first prototype that we made you know here in minneapolis i went to italy i flew to italy and i met with um two um two gentlemen at the time um who w would uh we sort of interviewed to be the head of our production team mm -hmm. and two attorneys to help us with, you know, making sure we were going to go explain this concept to all of these factories. They had every resource at their fingertips to do it themselves if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. So we wanted everyone to sign an NDA um, before we'd go and speak with them. Smart. So everything was written in Italian. Um, <laughs> but uh, the the gentleman who I met on that trip, um, who became the head of my uh, production team, just until recently, actually, he's just um, now retiring this year. But he helped me to understand how to manufacture it, how to industrialize huh. the idea. How did he react when you told him what you wanted to do and that comfort was going to be a key to this? What was the reaction? Well, he was extremely supportive and excited about the idea. Um, he had worked with a lot of um, big brands in the past. Um, uh, do you remember the brand Donald Pliner? Sure, of yeah, course. Big Big in the 90s. Yeah. Um, he was head of, of production um, and design for Donald Pliner for most of the 90s, a really long time, and was head of their Italian office. So speaks excellent English, which was r extremely helpful for me because I don't speak any Italian. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, he loved it. And um, and what was really fun, too, was when we I went around with him and another agent to all of the, the different factories. And um, I'm going to bore everyone to death with the process of footwear production, but... Um, the way that women's dress shoes work, and particularly in Italy, is that every component is made at a different factory. Hmm. So the heel factory is different from the insole factory, which is different from the factory that assembles all the parts. And um, the stitching room is, is a completely separate place, too. So... It was it was really fun to go to the insole factory because we were you know we even we invest so much in the insole, 
the insole factory said, finally, someone who cares about the insole. Yeah. Because the insole's been made the same way for decades. Um, and it's literally just compressed cardboard. Uh-huh. Uh, it's a little strip of material for cushioning, um, you know, wrapped in leather, and that's it. So we said, you know, no, ours is going to be layered. It's going to be contoured. And, um, you know, we're putting a, a lot of thought into every angle of of the insole. Mm-hmm. So so they were especially excited. You know, the joke when I was in school is um, a lot of people called biomechanics biomagic. <laughs> because it was like, well, maybe it happens that way. Let's uh-huh. see what happens. Um, but there are some general principles that are very reproducible. And one of the very reproducible uh, things is that more support is better than less. Mm-hmm. And generally speaking, for the average you know foot type, so um, so that was sort of that is one of the um, sort of myths that we are working to dispel because in the footwear industry, the idea of like memory foam, extra cushioning, um, that's not the answer. Really, you know, if if it was the answer, it sort of takes you back to my husband's question. Is, you know, if it was so easy, why doesn't everybody do it? Uh-huh. Uh, because you have to think about what what the shoe wearer is doing, what kind of activity are they doing when they're wearing that shoe? Mm. So obviously the needs of a dress shoe Mm -hmm. are completely different from the needs of a, let's say, skateboarding shoe. Sure. And I give that example because a skateboarding shoe is an example of a shoe that that shoe does need a lot of cushioning and padding, right? So skateboarders are falling from heights. Mm-hmm. Um, they're moving at high speeds um, while falling from heights. Mm-hmm. So they need shock absorption. Yep. Women um, in general wearing dress shoes, you're standing, walking, maybe you're at a brisk walk, mm-hmm. an occasional occasional um, running to a meeting, chasing a child yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> away from a sharp corner. Yeah. Um, so you have to think about you know what those needs are, and so in general for those activities you need more support. So more support means actually it's counterintuitive I know, but more stability and stiffness. Mm-hmm. So the example I like to give is um, when you look at surgical residents, um, surgeons, uh, hairstylists, chefs, the shoes they wear are wooden clogs Mm -hmm. and it's because you're on your feet and that support and when we talk about support it's the the arch height supporting the arch because if you wear a very flexible shoe usually it's because it has a lot of cushioning or it just is very flexible and soft that arch is allowed to flex or you know raise and lower repeatedly and that is generally what leads to soreness and fatigue over time Makes sense. Makes sense. Are you asleep? Did you, is everyone asleep? No, I'm Wake fascinated. Up. <laughs> so here's what I want to know. How long did it take you to, you, you've got this idea, maybe you're the person to make this designer shoe. You spend time ripping apart cheap shoes. You figure it out. You find your person in Italy. How long did all of that take? You get your you get your legal documents in order. Mm-hmm. What what was the length of that process? So uh, I filed the LLC registered. I registered for the LLC in May. Mm-hmm. I was on my first trip to Italy in October or November. That's pretty quick. So, yeah, we registered for that very first patent um, that that fall. I wanted to have the patent registered again before I spoke to any of the factories and producers over in Italy. And uh, then we, when I say we, my sister joined me on those first two trips to Italy, which was mm-hmm. really fun. Uh, we went back in the early spring. It was probably, you know, March or April and to see the first prototypes and see, you know, the first color cards from the tanneries, see what the trends were for that season. And then we met with buyers and editors for the first time in June of 2015. That's really fast. What what fascinates <laughs> me, I mean, it's actually, it makes sense that obviously you would understand the mechanics of it. That's what you, tra- you went to medical school. You 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 studied that. You you knew how to do this and you took the time to, to make it right. But how, but what about designing the look of the shoe? How did you know how to do that? And did you get any help from, you know, industry insiders or was that all you too? Yeah, no, no, no. So um, to be, yeah, to be very clear, my the head of my production team, you know, I, 
I don't know any, I didn't know any, I know a lot more than I did then, but I didn't know anything about pattern making mm -hmm. or, you know, troubleshooting and the technical aspects of, you know, footwear production. I didn't know about, you know, how many different players there were, you know, there being a, a last factory, a, a heel factory, an insole factory. I didn't know. So um, my, the, the head of my production team and our head technician really taught me everything that I needed to know. I mean, I, I, we would exchange, and this is how our relationship worked, you know, in, until, just now until he's retiring and we're um, hiring a, a new team, but we would exchange, you know, sketches and ideas. So I do sketch and I'd say, you know, this is what's missing from my closet. Huh. This is what, this is the concept. This is the shoe that I want to see this concept in yeah. first. So we started, um, we started with Mary Jane's. I'm, okay. I'm wearing a pair. Today. Yeah. Um, but the idea, the concept of that very first collection was, okay, women are going to hear this concept in this story and they're going to want to like totally start their footwear collection over. So how did retailers and consumers respond to Marion Park shoes? That's after the break. Today's episode is made possible with support from Platinum Bank. Is your bank a partner or simply a provider? In today's environment, businesses need a bank that can move quickly and act creatively. Platinum Bank understands the Twin Cities market, partnering with clients to overcome challenges and capitalize on opportunities. Their financial products and services are tailored to meet the unique needs of your organization. To learn how Platinum Bank can be an asset to your business, visit www.platinumbankmn.com. Platinum Bank, providing a means to a dream. After all the research and planning, Marion Park shoes were ready to launch. Let's hear how it went, and in just a bit, how it changed when we all started meeting barefoot over Zoom. So it, so 2016, that must have been when I first met you in your office, which was yeah. the size of a closet. I, I distinctly remember, I think it was Veronica Clark who owns a North Loop store called Danolo. Yes. She said to me, Allie, there is a shoe designer in town who you have to meet. And I was like, OK. And I figured, you know, it was going to be something crafty. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I don't know. I was just like, OK, fine. But so we emailed and I yeah. went and I remember walking up like, this can't be right. And you were like upstairs in some teeny tiny little space. And there you were with all of your boxes of shoes. And it was like, <laughs> what is happening? Who is this woman? And I just remember trying them on and going, oh, my God, like I am in heels. And these are comfortable. So, Allie, the reason that office felt like a closet is because it was a closet. <laughs> that the, the landlords of that building, it was somebody's storage. It just happened to have a window. It had a very small window. But it was somebody's storage yeah. closet. And I said to them, I said, look, I just, I've been doing this out of my you know, house. I, at the time, actually, we lived in an apartment. We lived at the Calhoun Beach Club uh -huh. you know, in that place. Yeah. And it was a two-bedroom apartment. It was my husband and I plus a baby. And I had been doing everything <laughs> in the corner of our bedroom. And I just thought, I need a space. So I went hunting. And it, and literally, they said, well, we could probably convert this storage space <laughs> into a very small office. And I said, I'll take it. But what's fascinating to me, and I know what really impressed me from the beginning, besides just your story and the fact that you were a podiatrist and you had figured this out and it was this big aha and it was kind of like, why hadn't anyone done this? But then comes the whole enormous journey and challenge of getting this product into stores. That is not an easy thing. And a lot of people fail right there. How did you do it? It still is not easy. Uh, I would say, uh, well, what's, what's nice, it's good and bad, I guess, in fashion is that they're always excited about something new and shiny. Mm -hmm. and so when we came forward in June, and when I say we, it was my sister, again, who went with me. Um, to market. My sister-in-law who kindly came and helped. Um, it was just me. I didn't have a single employee. <laughs> I packed everything up from that tiny closet office over mm -hmm. Spoon and Stable and, you know, shipped it to New York. And um, we had, you know, again, I, I had cold called and cold emailed stores, you know, boutiques across the U.S. Um, is where I started. And then, um, you know, a lot of them were interested and took my call and said, sure, I'll, I'll come and see. And um, some of them would say, oh, we don't, sweetie, we don't sell shoes like that. <laughs> because <laughs> they didn't really get it. And I understand 
you know, they didn't understand that we were, you know, doing this on a very, you know, high level. Of- did Did you accidentally say sensible? Or something I don't know. Like Maybe that? did was I say the <laughs> wrong thing? It's very yeah. possible. It's so very who possible. was the first one to, to bite? Who who? Where did you get your first order? Well, so I'm from Oklahoma, and there was a really beautiful store, which you know, I, um, my husband and I moved here after Dayton's was um, already closed. Yeah. So I've only heard what Dayton's was like. So um, it sounds like the store where I grew up in Oklahoma was very similar to that. So they carried you know, really lovely brands. Um, it's called Balliots. Uh, and uh, Balliots, yeah, they, we, they placed an order. Same thing for a, a similar uh, store in Little Rock, Arkansas called Barbara Jean. Okay. Um, they placed an order. And then the the very first department store to carry us was Bloomingdale's, um, which was surprising because we had, um, and we still are talking to a lot of the department stores, um, and because Bloomingdale's doesn't have a reputation really for um, scouting new brands, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but but Bloomingdale's, um, their um, fashion director reached out and said, I've you know, seen your press and I want to come and take a look. And I think at the time they were, they were kind of ready to take some risks. Mm-hmm. So Bloomingdale's was our first department store partner. Speaking of press, I think that's something that you very wisely did early on. You had you hired a publicist. Right. You had a story to tell and you you obviously knew that that was going to be a big part of it, right? For sure. And um, it was interesting because the first few consultants that we hired, I thought, oh, I, when you saw the price tag <laughs> When you when you don't have a, a lot of money when you're starting um, a business, you think, oh my gosh, that is a lot of money. Yeah. And um, I was very fortunate that all the consultants that we hired early on very quickly, you know, proved their value beyond beyond anything that we paid them. Mm-hmm. So, particularly the uh, the publicists, um, because I mean, press and telling our story. I mean, that's that's the big point of difference is our story and. Um, and so, you started getting press right away. We did, yeah. Um, even before we shipped the first pair of shoes, which was really cool. Yeah. Um, you were one of the first, uh, Allie. Yeah, I was there, yes. So, you know, it's really funny. You're, you'll you'll uh, appreciate this. So the same month that your story ran, mm-hmm. um, there was a shoe, this shoe that I have on today, our Bernadette block heel sandal was in W mm-hmm. magazine. Was I remember. October issue of W. Yeah. yeah. And people started saying, you know, I, we were out and about and- and I'd uh, start talking about my shoes, and someone would say, oh, "I heard about your shoe. I saw your shoes somewhere. Where did I see your shoes?" And I said, oh, "Did you see them in W?" Yeah. And they said, "No, I saw Allie Kaplan stuff <laughs> <laughs> in well, Minneapolis St. Paul." There magazine. we go. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> was, Take that W. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it was that's so. A, that's it was lovely. To this day, honestly, it was one of my favorite initial stories. I so. love that. Well. Um, you mentioned money. How did you get the money? How did you pay to manufacture your first batch, your first collection? First batch. Yeah. Fresh, <laughs> fresh batch. Um, it's funny. My brother, who has his MBA, is a really smart guy. He says the same thing, too. He's like, how many batches? Uh, how many batches <laughs> are you making this year? How did you know? I mean, I, how did you even know how many shoes to make in your initial orders? Well, well, to rewind in terms of how we paid for it. So my husband and I and our family bootstrap the business until about three years ago mm-hmm. um, and when we took on our first investors outside of our family. So that's how um, we got to that, you know, that first mm-hmm. sort of milestone. Um, but there are factory minimums to uh, answer your second okay. question. How so, many how many p- shoes do you buy? So they so, told you how many you were going right, to buy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And did were you was that a daunting number? Did did you oh, yeah. were you able to place them all in stores? Well, what's even more daunting is, you know, stores come in and they say, we'll take, you know, 200 pairs of shoes. Oh, by the way, we'll pay you in 30 days. Uh huh. And, you know, it takes time to get the shoes over from Italy. So and you have to pay the factories, too. So there is um, in, in fashion, there is this long cycle. Yeah. Um, between when you first place that order. So let's you know, say, for example, um, Balliots in Oklahoma City, they place an order in June. We put a deposit down at the factory a month later. They get those shoes in like November and then they pay us for them, you know, 30 days after that. So mm-hmm. the cycle goes from like July to yeah. December, especially when you're producing in Italy and you're, you know, you're working with these 
you know, amazing craftsmen. It's not fast, fast fashion. Everything is handmade. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it's a longer cycle. Yeah. And were you figuring all that out? Were you doing the math and the, On the orders fly. and the calculations? I mean, that was all you. Uh, yeah, to start, yeah. Uh, and I didn't. I hired my first employee. Uh, gosh, it'll be. I think she she joined in 2017. And before that, I mean, Allie, I didn't know what a packing slip was. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was so much learning. <laughs> yeah. Did who did you? I mean, was there anyone you could go to for for help with all that on the on the business side? I mean, did you realize what you were getting into here? I, I, no, I didn't. <laughs> you know, this this whole idea of like you focus on the how and you figure out the why later. That's. I mean, I still sort of operate. To, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, along those lines to this day. Uh, no, I just I knew that we would get it figured out. Um, I, and, and, you know, who was helping me, my brother who has his MBA, you know, he showed me how to register for my LLC, for example. Uh -huh. and, um, you know, I think I, I, I always took the meeting. I always, you know, reached out and, you know, if someone reached out to me, I'd always go meet with them. And, uh, I think our lawyers at the time helped me a lot because I was trying to make sure that we were protecting the intellectual property of the business. Um, accountants, you know, were, um, were helpful all the time, obviously, um, and the rest of it was, you know, kind of, you know, just figuring out, you know, yeah. think on your feet. How many employees do you have now? Well, pre-COVID, we had seven. Um, and uh, at the moment, we have four. Okay. Um, I want to talk about this year. But before we do that, um, was there a moment or what was the moment when you knew this is going to work? What, was, it, was it Bloomingdale's? Was it something after that? When did you know this was going to be successful? So my husband laughs. It, this is the true answer, honestly. This is when I felt truly validated. So um, do you know the, um, the actress, singer, songwriter, writer, Carrie Brownstein? She's on Portlandia. Yeah. She's yeah. widely called, like, the coolest. Mm -hmm person out there sure. she's super chill she's yep. you know in a band and she you know she wrote Portlandia and, mm -hmm. um, along with Fred Armisen and uh, anyway she wrote a memoir that um, came out in 2015 and just small you know small world happenstance her um, stylist uh, at the time was in a band with our photographer in New York and when we were shooting the very first photo shoot, I had said to our photographer, we were talking about, you know, who, you know, if you could, you know, pick anyone to wear your shoes, who would it be? And I said, I just I mean, Carrie Brownstein, right? She's like the ultimate cool girl. Um, I think what, you know, some some things about this brand make people hesitant. Again, like those retailers who say, oh, we don't carry shoes like that. Mm -hmm. Like we need someone who's like super cool to validate like this is this is a cool brand. Right. So I like Carrie Brownstein, she's amazing. And then he said, well, just. My bass player actually is her stylist. I was like, are you kidding me? This is crazy. So she came to that first, that June presentation that we had and told her all about the shoes. And anyway, so um, we made a pair of shoes for her uh, and we sent them to her. We weren't sure when she would wear them, if she would wear them ever. Yeah. And actually we were at a, um, a hockey game with some friends and I got a text from her stylist and said, she said, Carrie's wearing your shoes tonight on the Late Show. <gasps> it was like, no way. Yeah. And I almost said to my husband, I was like, I don't even want to go to the hockey game. Oh, right. We're going to get hockey. Yeah, we're yeah. going to go, you know, <laughs> turn on the TV. And, um, and so she, there she was, we got home, you know, sitting there, you know, in the chair next to Stephen Colbert. And she got this great shot of her foot. And it looks uh. gorgeous and you know, so beautiful. And again, she was on this book tour. So like the next day, she's, I see her on Instagram and she's, we sent her two pairs, two different colors. One was like a cranberry suede. Which style? Which was it? The one? Mitchell. Actually, okay. do you, you might have them. I don't which, know. which I don't the pointed toe it's this style but it's a stiletto with several straps these buckles yes yes yes, yes. um so we sent them in these two colors she wore the sort of red cranberry red pair on late night the next day she's wearing the black mm -hmm. on her book tour and i was like oh my god so i text her stylist again saying oh my god she's wearing the other pair this is so yeah. exciting the next day she wore them again <gasps> And then the next day she wore them again. Because they were so comfortable. And that was it, Allie. So, yeah. I know, so I said to her stylist, I was like, oh my gosh, she wore them again. She goes, yeah. I can't get them off of her. She says they're so comfortable. Huh. And I was like, this is it. Uh, this is, this yeah, is the moment. That's I, when you knew. Yeah. And so I said, I said to my husband, I said, I feel so validated. I was like, yeah. that really, you know, what, what, 
we say is true. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I can just quit now. And he's like, all right, slow down. <laughs> you got to pay for all these yeah. shoes. You need to sell a few of those. All right. 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 So we were growing over 50% year over year, and then COVID hit. Mm-hmm. How many stores were you in in like early to 2020? You know, it's it was probably close to 40 or, or 50 doors. Okay. Um, at, including like Shopbop, yeah. you know, on, online retailer. Um, How much of your business was um, in store versus online? So I'm glad you asked that question because COVID was has been a major disruptor in what that um, – what that distribution is and should be. And Mm -hmm. that's a big conversation in fashion right now. So what everyone's sort of been working towards is this idea of having your direct business be the majority of your business. Um, The ratio that we tend to see a lot is 70% direct. So whether it's your brick and mortar store or online direct business, and then only 30% uh, is wholesale. Hmm. Pre-COVID, we had that ratio flipped. Yeah. So you're literally catching us um, mid mid substance to use a surgical term yeah. um, in in that um, in that process of really f- reversing that ratio um, because you know with COVID all these stores closed and um, you know we we didn't have control over uh, you know where all these shoes I mean there was a huge inventory backlog I'm sure you've talked mm-hmm. to a lot of people about that um in fashion when when COVID hit because all these retailers just had to cancel and slash and cut sure, sure. orders and um and so we we realized you know we need to take more ownership um be able to control our business more but and also be able to control the narrative better mm-hmm. because you don't really know if the you know salesperson at a particular store you know, if if they know the full story. Right. Um, it's so interesting because it's kind of the exact opposite of what you thought at the beginning, which yeah. is that you need to be in the best stores that ha- that are reputable because they're going to help sell it and you're going to look good being on the shelf next to a Jimmy Choo or Manolo Blahnik and people have to try it on, right? But now are you kind of saying, nope, we're, we're going to do it, go at our own, on our own? No, no. I, we still very much believe in wholesale. I still, um, and all of our, our team, our investors, um, and 